years ago, Dartmoor Prison was the end of the line for the hard men of British crime. The toughest jail in the system. It was from here that the Cray Gang arranged the escape of a man they saw as one of their own. An East Ender born and bred. Prisoner number 635 was Frank Samuel Mitchell. He was already a notorious prison escaper when the Crays took him off the moor and sparked the biggest manhunt in British criminal history. Mitchell put his trust in the Crays, but in return they destroyed him. He disappeared having spent half his life behind bars and just 11 days on the run. Tonight, we solve the mystery of what became of Britain's most wanted man, who found fame and misfortune as a fugitive from the law. Now these people looking vastly relieved as the band carrying Frank Mitchell comes in. There are a crowd of women and children here and policemen and warders watching him being brought back. Frank Mitchell first met the Cray brothers on the streets of the East End and later on in prison. The Crays were status-conscious criminal social clients, and they were drawn to Mitchell by his reputation as the most rebellious man in the prison system. Joining the Crays became Mitchell's prison fantasy, but he had no real grasp of the violence and ruthlessness that underpinned the firm. He dreamed of joining the firm and was captivated by a comic book idea of the life of a gangster. I became known as Reggie's man. I went practically everywhere with Reggie and uh, whatever business he was in I, I would just stand there and growl at people and back him up to me. Reggie Cray recruited Albert Donahue to the firm after first shooting him in the leg as a punishment for insulting the twins but when he didn't grasp he was put on the payroll and became a core member of the Cray organization. Prior to that I worked on doors in the clubs and spielers and places like that and then collected I used to collect on the Friday the the milk round we called it protection money in the 1960s distrust of the police was a proud tradition in the East End the Crays depended on this and the fear they instilled to expand their empire of extortion the Crays had ambitions to become the criminal warlords of the East End, to weave themselves into the fabric of the local community, demanding tribute and dispensing rough justice. Local people relied on each other because there was self-help or no help. The Crays had a sentimental attachment to the community spirit which excluded outsiders, but also protected villains. They cast themselves as benefactors, collecting money for the local men, the ones in prison, the aways. The twins would wait until, say, so Friday or a Saturday night, the pub was pretty well packed with faces, all, all his faces. And uh, then Ronnie would say to someone, sometimes me, sometimes somebody else, get the list up for the aways. Anyone who's locked up. And go around do a collection. Leave it till about 10 when they're all nicely ripe, you know. Then this money would be sent to, somebody might be short of rent or electric money or money to go on a long distance visit. And that is where this Robin Hood thing came from. Although it wasn't their money, they had been instrumental in getting it together and sending it round. Were you aware that Frank Mitchell was one of the people that they cultivated in this way? Well, yeah, and uh, because of their names, and because of his name, obviously they... He's like the two toughest guys on the block they're going to meet one day. I'm pretty sure Ronnie... Always in the back of his mind is one day we're going to get nicked and it's best to look after these prison legends. Well, the first impression of Frank Mitchell is his size. He was about six foot three. Uh, he had a 54 inch chest, about a 34 inch waist and he really was a really big powerful looking man. 
not unusual for him to drop on the floor and do endless press-ups just to demonstrate his strength. And he was prone to picking people up as well, at short notice. I think there was a hidden agenda for him, it was like a demonstration that, you know, I really am a powerful man, and although I'm a nice, pleasant guy, there theoretically could be another side to me if things went wrong. And I think that's the message he wanted to get over. Frank Mitchell was one of seven children born in the 1930s to a poor family in Bow, in the heart of London's East End. His education took second place to scrapping in the streets. He was sent to a special school for children with learning difficulties. Mitchell was easily influenced by the street gangs around him, and soon found himself in trouble with his father, and then the law. My dad told us that when Frankie was eight, he stole a bike, and instead of letting Frankie keep the bike, he took him to the police station to get a telling off for Frankie's own good, because he didn't want him to steal things. And instead of the police telling him off, they took him to a magistrate's court and they put him on probation. And from there it just went on. Frankie was inside more than he was out. Well, his strength really was a disadvantage to him. Because that caused a lot of trouble. It's the prison officers he didn't really like. They made him more, they upset him more, and that's how he got in more trouble, and that's how he got more time added on. In 1962, age 33, Mitchell fetched up at Dartmoor after being shunted like a bad penny around almost every institution the system had to offer. He'd been incarcerated for all but a few months since the age of 17, half his adult life. Mitchell came of age behind bars in a world where violence ensured survival and defying authority earned respect. No prison could handle him for long, but in the Dartmoor regime he found an outlet for his physical prowess. All in for work. I knew him pretty well, actually. I spent a lot of time with him. I worked with him on and off for about six months on a quarry party, and then I worked with him outside the prison for about four months. Prison is deferred to him because of his reputation as a pecking order, and he was at the top of the pecking order. He was big Frank, man. He was the man or one of the very few people in prison who was known probably throughout the whole system. Uh, and that was based on his, his history. Um, history he'd of been, violence. He'd been, yeah, he'd been in prison on a number of occasions. He'd been birched once for assault and a member of staff. And he, he'd, been, he, he'd been flogged, I think, for cutting an officer's face with a knife. Flogging his, means exactly uh, what? Whipping. Whipping, put over a bench and actually whipped. Uh, cat and nine tails. He'd suffered that, which was very unusual even in those days. Frank Mitchell was trapped in a vicious circle of rebellion and punishment, and in the end the prison system washed its hands of him. He was certified mentally defective and sent to Rampton Secure Hospital. He bitterly opposed the move and it was to have a profound effect on his chances of release. As the police officer who jailed the craze recalls, he rebelled in the only way he knew. He'd been birched, he'd been flogged, he'd been certified insane, he'd been confined in, in uh, solitary and confinement and that kind of thing. So he'd, he'd had an awful life, really. Uh, and then when he got to Rampton, he escaped and he went into a house and he terrorised the people in the house with an axe. And of course, some journalist immediately picked that up and he was identified from thenceforth as the Mad Axe Man. Mitchell was recaptured and sent to Broadmoor Secure Hospital. But 18 months later, in July 1958, he was out again, using the same trick. He had fashioned a key from one of his bed springs. This was Mitchell's fifth escape. His aim was to be transferred back to a normal prison. Typically, it was thanks to Mitchell himself he was caught. He met two down and outs in Bournemouth. After boasting he was the mad axeman, he told them he was heading home on the next coach to London. They told the police and the bus was stopped. He had been free for just 36 hours. On information, the coach was stopped at Hartley Row and uh, Mitchell was taken off it. The public had behaved very well and by their helpful cooperation and keenness, it's helped our task considerably. We've had the aid of the soldiers, the Navy with a helicopter, 
and our own police, our own dogs, and dogs from neighbouring county, and our colleagues from neighbouring county. There are a crowd of women and children here and policemen and warders watching him being brought back. It was at about quarter to five that we first got an idea that Mitchell had been captured and since then he's been in Hartley Whitney Police Station. Now these people looking vastly relieved and smiling and quite cheerful as the van carrying Frank Mitchell comes in. Mitchell's brief spell of freedom got him into the worst trouble he'd ever known. During a break-in to get clothes and money, he held a couple hostage and slightly injured the husband in a scuffle. His meagre haul was a car he couldn't drive, ten and ninepence in change, and some clothes. The hue and cry had made him famous, and now the law was going to make an example of him. Mitchell pleaded guilty to robbery with violence. On conviction, he got an extraordinary sentence, life imprisonment. But not everyone saw a monster there, not even the woman he robbed. My advice to people is to treat him kindly and give him what he wants. If he wants a car, let, them ha let him have it, or money or anything, just to get him. He won't hurt anyone, if they'll only do that. Be nice to him be and nice, he won't hurt. Yes, be nice to him and, and I don't think they'll come to any harm. The apparent injustice of Mitchell's punishment brought out the craze charitable instincts. Mitchell's prison file, which was secret until it was released for this program, contains telegrams from the Crays requesting more and more visits. They visited Mitchell whatever prison he was in, and Mitchell wrote to them frequently. Mitchell wrote scores of letters to the Cray family home in Valence Road, Bethnal Green. We have obtained the ones which were stopped by the prison authorities because they showed Mitchell's growing frustration at having served eight years of his life sentence with still no prospect of a release date. I've tried to avoid trouble. I act the mug. But if they're going to keep pushing me, I've got to play me hand the other way. Can't take any more. Well, I've got so I don't worry what happens to me anymore. What chance have I got of getting out if they won't give me a chance to do my time like the other lads? Mitchell's family was not aware of the depth of his growing frustration. But they did know, and worry about, the influence the craze had over him. One Christmas, um, they knocked at the door and threw some money up the passage and said it was a Christmas present from Franco. The Mitchell family lived in Old Ford Road. The Cray visit was not welcome. Mitchell's father, Sam, rushed into the street throwing the bundle of notes after the twins. He did not want his son, much less his family, tainted by association. We was just an ordinary family. I mean, our family wasn't gangsters, because Frankie was in trouble. Um, none of us was in any trouble, and because of Frankie, people portrayed us as yeah, trouble. Like Brenda, do you think the craze set out to genuinely help Frank? No, because Frankie was big. Um, they thought that, well, they could use him or something for their own purpose. As a criminal? Yeah. In part two, eyewitnesses tell of the crazed plot to spring Frank Mitchell from Dartmoor and cover themselves in glory. But the firm's good deed ends in murder. Dartmoor's punishment block is the most forbidding part of this forbidding place. But in all Mitchell's four years at the prison, he never once ended up in the punishment cells. Just as the Crays were adopting Frank Mitchell as a good cause, he was tiring of his role as scourge of the system. The Dartmoor files show Mitchell, now 37, in danger of becoming a model prisoner. In October 1966, senior staff at Dartmoor carried out the review that followed a prisoner completing eight years of a life sentence. The deputy governor noted, he must be given something to aim at, and there is only one target which can be set, a date of release. If he is not fit for a date to be named now, he never will be. The governor wrote, I have recommended before that he should be given a date for release, no matter how far ahead, and I recommend it again now. 
The governor, Dennis Malone, and other senior staff at the prison clearly sympathised with Mitchell's plight. Mitchell petitioned the Home Office for a date of release many times without success. He wrote that he was choked at serving a life sentence even though he had not killed anybody and complained of watching murderers being released ahead of him and feeling like a dead man. As petition after petition failed, the governor decided to reward Mitchell with the highest privilege a Dartmoor prisoner could earn, a place on the so-called honour party, which worked on the moor, outside the prison. The message was that we trust you. You had to give your word that you weren't going to escape. That's why it was called the honour party. And was a stepping stone and a signpost that somewhere in the future there was possible release. The honour party worked at a place called Bagator, about 12 miles from the prison. It had places for just six of Dartmoor's 600 prisoners, based at this lonely hut. Their job was to repair fences, to keep livestock off the nearby army firing ranges. They cooked their own meals and were trusted to work unsupervised for long periods. When severe weather closed in, they sheltered there and Mitchell revealed his naivety about the world outside prison. He did have a curiosity about family life, how to treat children and, you know, spend people spend, how does somebody spend their life with, with one other person, you know, marriage, what does that mean? There were two crucial things about Frank Mitchell the authorities did not know. First, during one of his rare spells out of jail, he had fathered a child, which he died without seeing. Secondly, he was increasingly falling under the influence of the craze. Members of the firm would hide money for him on the moor. As police investigating his murder discovered, Mitchell was leading a life like no other Dartmoor prisoner. Although he cooperated with the officers in charge of the, of the party, he also went off to uh, public houses. He, at one stage, took a taxi from one of the pubs and went into Tavistock to buy budgerigar. I saw him a fortnight ago yesterday at the Elephant's Nest. That's the local pub, is it? That's right, yes. I had a telephone message to take him to Exeter. I went up to the pub. He said he didn't really want to go to Exeter. He just wanted to go into Oakhampton to buy a budgie. Well, he's been in um, quite a lot of times and always bought a great deal of drink. Um, this is one thing that we remember him by because he was a very good customer. The rumour is that he told you, your husband, he was going away for a time. He'll be back next Christmas or after Christmas. After Christmas. He said, uh, well, I won't be seeing you um, over Christmas, um, but um, probably uh, I'll see you anyway sometime after Christmas. Court files show that in the months leading up to Christmas 1966, the visits from the Crays and their gang members increased. Usually under false names, they brought Ronnie's greetings, more money and promises of help. Two months before Mitchell escaped, Albert Donahue came on a visit with Ronnie Cray. There was a screw wandering about, just keeping his eye open. And Mitchell, he was definitely in charge. You know, he did his usual cabaret, just walked over and picked him up and waved him around, you know and forced him to laugh, and he was going blue in the face, the poor old screw. Yeah. Mitchell also had serious business to discuss with Ronnie. The honour party, which had given him a taste of freedom, was about to shut down for the winter, and the governor, who had so strongly supported his demand for a release date, was about to retire. Mitchell was getting desperate. So he's back to square one. He's been a good boy for four years and nothing's happened. So he's getting really pissed off with this, you know, he wants to come out. Did Mitchell make that complaint when you were on the visit to yeah, him? to Ronnie. What did he actually say? He said they're messing me about, Ron. So Ronnie said, but don't worry, we'll get you home, we'll get you home. Ronnie Cray was nothing if not a man of his work. He soon had members of the firm herring around Dartmoor with stopwatches, trying to see how long it would take them to get Mitchell off the moor and safely on the road to London. Ronnie's plan was to hide Mitchell in the East End, tell the press about his plight, and then have Mitchell give himself up once he had got a release date. But their timing was off. They hatched the escape plan just as the Home Secretary was talking tough on crime. From now on, the life sentence could mean just that. It was fairly evident that Frank took that to heart, and I think he believed that that may well apply to him. 
but he did desperately want that next time post for the future that there was a possibility he was going to get out and at that time he didn't have it. At about 11 o'clock on Monday, December the 12th, 1966, Ronnie Cray's ill-conceived plan and Frank Mitchell's desperation at an uncertain future came together. Mitchell decided to run for it, hoping the journey would take him to a new life. Members of the firm had no such illusions, but knew better than to voice their doubts. I couldn't say to Ronnie, this is stupid, because it was his idea. <laughs> I'd have probably got shot or something. Again, no, I said, uh, we just went along with it. Nobody believed it would ever happen. You know. Mitchell collected a homemade knife he had hidden on the moor. None of his six previous escapes had seen him at large for more than three days. This time, however, he had the backup of the Cray firm. Anyway, it snowballs. We were located on the map. The phone box by some funny tour or whatever it was. We drove down here and he was spot on time. Well, I was I was sitting in the car. Teddy Smith has gone in the phone box to make it look okay. You know, anyone passing by? And around the bend in the road comes Marching Mitchell, and uh, he took a rush at Teddy Smith. I don't know why. I said, "Hey, Frank, get in the car. It's all right. He's, like, he's with us." He got in the car, I chucked him this parcel of kit we had and I said, get yourself changed. And that's when he's pulled his bloody great tool out of his pocket. What's that? What's that on there? I had to explain to him that we were getting him out so he could write to different people to say that now he wants a date. So I said, if you carry that, if we get stopped and you've got that in your pocket, and that blows the whole non-violence bit. You've got to get rid of it. Anyway, we managed to get it off him, chuck it away. Oh, he, he loved it. We were listening to all the news on the way down, but nothing. We were in, in a flat in Barking, and then the telly came on, six o'clock news, and it was on there. More or less shoot on site sort of thing. I think they had the Marines out or somebody looking for him, all those searching them all. But he was, as I say, he was tucked away. This is the ground floor flat where Mitchell was actually harboured by Donoghue when he was returned to London. The Barking Road flat had no locks, no bars on the windows, no slopping out bucket. But Mitchell could no more leave it than if he'd still been in his cell in Dartmoor. And, like the Dartmoor jailers, Mitchell's minders had to stay on his right side. You just could, you couldn't tell him anything. You, you would have to persuade him that something was the best thing to do, and he would do it. But if you said, oi, do that, well, he'd been off, you know, in trouble. He would get up very early, as per prison times, you know, um, straight away mother T. Then he would want to do some press ups and sit ups and make his bed, clean his bed area. Then he would want his breakfast. Then it'd be more sit ups and maybe play cards, arm wrestle. We loved arm wrestling because there was no one that could beat him. It was like wrestling a tree. You know. Bosh, he was gone. And he was more than more than capable of uh, heavy violence. I knew there was going to be a major problem. What I didn't expect that suddenly the press would do this, did describe Mitchell as the most dangerous man in Britain, where I'd been sat with this basically gentle giant. I couldn't put the two things together. This is the cell where Mitchell spent the last four years of his prison life. He had been on the Dartmoor Honour Party for four months. After his escape, it was scrapped. I mean, it hit me like a bombshell. Later on when I thought about it, I didn't feel betrayed by him. I think he was a victim, actually. 
certainly the means didn't come from him. They were furnished from outside by, by people. Um, and they had responsibility at that point, but for some reason they, they couldn't hack it. And he caught it as a consequence. Mitchell's hideout was only three miles from his family home, but phoning, let alone visiting, was out of the question. Mitchell wanted to see Ronnie, but he too was hiding from the police and chose to stay away. Watched all the news, all the programmes, everything. For the first, I should think about four or five days, it was all Mitchell. Bang, 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 Mitchell. Troops looking for him and even the cartoons are about. I think Giles did one. Then that slowed down. Everything seemed to slow down. It wasn't too long before he started getting fed up. It was just one prison for another one. He was expecting the twins to be all over him. And he thought he was going to go to all these nightclubs and pubs and be the star. But that didn't happen. So he was gradually this set into him. We told Reggie that he kept asking for him and uh, he was worried because nobody had been to see him. So Reggie said, oh, I'll pop round. But it was all very casual. I don't, think, I don't think Reggie had any great liking for him, not, not to the, as much as Ronnie. You know. he, he was Ronnie's baby, if you like. It wasn't, wasn't Reggie's cup of tea at all. But Reggie showed up just to keep things sort of quiet, you know. Then that wore off. So the next thing was we get him a girl. This is Lisa, the, the girl that was actually kidnapped by Reggie Cray and uh, another member of the gang from Winston's nightclub where she was working as a hostess and taken it immediately to that flat that we saw the picture of where Mitchell was waiting and she was there to satisfy his sexual needs. She was a, a woman that could uh, engage you in, in uh, any kind of conversation. Uh, she got an incredible repertoire. She and Frank Mitchell formed some kind of bond in the very short time that they were together. Lisa meet Mad Axman. And they just stood there. She was a little bit shocked and because uh, she couldn't have missed the news in the last few days. Uh, but he was just grinning, you know, this is mine, sort of thing, you know, Christmas. And uh, that was it. I shut the door, left them in the room on their own. According to her, he was quite a stud, you know, and um, but he used to like her watching his workouts trying to impress her, I don't know, but um, nobody could look at her for too long, sort of thing. That was his woman, and that was it. Me, Tars, and you, Jane, sort of thing. She complained a couple of times that she wanted to go, and they said, no, you're here now, you've got to wait until he goes. Uh, then, then she was escorted home to get some change of clothes and brought back and uh, that was it. She was, she was a prisoner as well, really. She couldn't go out or anything like that. Unless she was accompanied, you know. What would have happened if Frank Mitchell had not liked her? I... I... I don't... I don't really know. I think possibly... Once she knew where he was and that, she'd have had to go swimming in a fatal accident in the Thames or something like that. You know. Mitchell's prison file contains a Christmas card from Teddy Smith, one of the men who drove him off the moor. It was meant to make the police think he knew nothing about the escape. On day six of Mitchell's freedom, the craze ordered Smith to the flat to help draft Mitchell's letters to the newspapers, asking for a date of release. It was like a mother talking to a five-year-old, getting ready to go to school, you know. Uh, and I didn't like, and it was stuff like that. It was all childish, you know. And so I would get out as quick as possible. 
once he's quieted down. You know. Mitchell's letters to the newspapers made it clear his escape was a protest and that he was willing to give himself up if he got a release date. But no politician was going to bargain with an escaped criminal. It was politically impossible. Sir, my absence from Dartmoor was to bring to notice my unhappy plight. To be truthful, I'm asking for a possible date of release. From the age of nine, I've not been completely free. Sir, I ask you, where is the fairness of this? His pleas fell on deaf ears, and his father appealed on television for Frank to give himself up. Mr. Mitchell, have you got anything to say to Frank? Any message for him? Well, I have is, I, I say, it's your old part, Dad, Frank. And I'd like to see you get a definite date and give yourself up so you can go back and finish whatever it is and come out again. And so I want to see you. I'm going to see you at home, you Sam Mitchell's appeal meant nothing to the craze. Two days later, Frank was executed on their orders. In part three, his killer talks for the first time. In the cramped flat where Mitchell was hiding, it was increasingly obvious that the craze plot was unravelling and nerves were frayed. It would have all been a bit crazy, the atmosphere in the flat, you know. One guy sitting there sucking a bottle of whiskey and taking pills, and the other two sort of mooching about, bored out of their skull, and the other one doing press-ups. It would have been a weird old situation. Lisa sussed that he could blow up at any minute, but uh, I don't know, maybe a job prepared, a, she could handle a guy, you know. She knew how to calm him right down and keep him happy. With as much sex as he could. Yeah. But, uh, I say the man was a bull. It didn't quiet him down as much as he thought. And uh, then he started threatening to visit the mother's address, Valence Road. Because they'd been writing to him, so he knew where they were. This is a knife that uh, Frank Mitchell actually made whilst he was serving his sentence in Dartmoor. It was made in the prison. And this together with a mask and uh, his, the rest of his prison clothes was found at the roadside by the police a couple of days later. Over a week into the manhunt, the police had found Mitchell's clothes but still had no leads as to his whereabouts. As the hunt continued, Mitchell's minders were growing increasingly worried about his state of mind. One of them, Scotch Jack Dixon, was alarmed to discover that Mitchell had got hold of another weapon. Scotch Jack woke up one night and he's standing over him with a big kitchen knife. And he said, tell the twins, if they don't get round here, I'll come round there. But he reported this to the twins, so now Reggie squirts off and reports it to Ronnie and that was it. The Crays now had a problem. They wanted to make disappear. There was only one man in London capable of providing the service they needed. Freddie Foreman. Foreman's criminal pedigree was every bit as strong as the Crays but in a different department. He was a thief, not a gangster. A careful plotter of bank raids and armed robberies. He led a close-knit group of hardcore villains with a reputation for extreme violence. Rumour said even murder. Foreman was from South London, not the East End, but he knew the craze well. Throughout the 60s, they had been secret partners in crime, each supporting the other's reputation. The craze wanted Foreman to do something about Mitchell. The escape was running out of control and the craze felt threatened. The problem was written all over their faces. Charlie and, and Reggie was ill, they were looking ill, they had big rings under around their eyes and worried that sick out and then Daddy was talking about going round to their house and uh, to see their mother and um, he, he was going to hold them responsible if, if he got arrested. He wasn't going to go in quietly, he was going to take six coppers with him. That's all he kept saying, oh, I'm not, I will not go back to prison, I'm not going to go and spend the rest of my life in prison. The twins 
They were afraid because they'd have helped him to escape and they was going to be looking at some sort of time, uh, five years a piece or something for harboring and helping her escape. And, and you know, it's worked with Frank because he he's capable of anything. There might have been a murder charge on the end of that. The day before Christmas Eve, 1966, 11 days into the escape, the Craze and Freddie Foreman met to decide Mitchell's fate. We went to a guy called Harry Hopman's house. And it was Charlie Craig, Reggie, and Freddie Foreman. So me and Harry Hopman had left in the kitchen. They go in another room. Uh, about 20 minutes later, they came out. And it was Charlie who came to me and he said, uh, we've decided to take Big Frank down to camp and he's going to spend Christmas with Ronnie. But we've got to get him out of the flat in Darkin and we've got to separate him from this girl because Ronnie don't want women running around his house. So, so it all sounded OK, it sounded true. Donahue left Hopwood's flat believing Frank Mitchell was going to the country. He was wrong. In fact, Ronnie Cray had already ordered his murder and called on Foreman to be the executioner. They thought I might do it a bit better. I'll be more proficient in, in doing it properly, you know? I suppose I was more sort of professional. So they called you in because yeah. they wanted to get away with it? Yeah, yeah. Within hours, Foreman's gang was on the road to the hideout and Mitchell was looking forward to a Christmas among trusted friends. Oh, he was, he was happy, because the way I put it, I said, uh, you're on the move, Frank, you're going, you're going down the country to stay with Ronnie. Yeah. Oh, good, he said. I said, you'd be able to have Christmas together, and he went, yeah, good, my old mate, right. At last, he was going to see him, you know. So that, that took his head off it. I said, the only thing is, I said, uh, case, get a stop. I said, you don't want Lisa with you. So you'll follow on with me half hour later. You could see the sense of that, you know, uh, taking care of Lisa, yeah. Did Mitchell trust you? Yeah. While Foreman's gang made their way across London, the Crays were relying on Donoghue to charm Mitchell out of the flat and round to the rendezvous with the van in Ladysmith Avenue. Foreman was sitting in the back of the van with another man, widely known in the underworld as a killer. The Alfie Jarrett was with me, and then he was, he was a good man to have with you. And then uh, to get this done as quick as possible. And another person I won't mention who was driving. And they went and pulled the van out and met me, and we, uh, we went over to Barking. We walked from the flat. 15 yards or so to, to the road. You know, as we turn into the road, there's a young copper on patrol walking, beat. And he's walking towards us and I felt Frank stiffen up and I, I had to say, calm down, calm down. You know. And we just strolled past the copper. If you're sitting in a cold winter's night in the back of a van waiting to to commit a horrible crime, it's not very nice that feeling, obviously. It's nothing you're getting any pleasure out of doing. But uh, of course, when, it, when the, he came into view, he and Albert brought him around the, around the corner uh, in, the, in the street lights, and he walked down, and the back door opened, and he climbed in and sat down. And it had to be, it's got to be done properly and mercifully as quickly as possible. And when the, the engine the driver revved the engine to drive away, and it sounded like a, a backfire. And the sooner it was done and over with, the better, and which it was. And that sounds, I know it sounds very clinical and uh, cold-blooded. When you said you tried to make it quick, mm. what does that actually involve? Oh, in the target, in the, in the spot where it, and it's not prolonged. How many people were armed in the van? Only two, the elf and myself. And it was 
battle was all over in seconds. He didn't even know what, what, that, what hit him. I mean, it was done, finished. I put Frank in first, and he, Freddie said, Get, sit on a wheelbase. So I went to sit with him. So he went, no, you go up the front and tell the driver how to get back to the tunnel. And I didn't realise it at the time till I was there. As he slammed his door, that was the signal for the guns. Mitchell sort of gone forward to the driver. And then the door banged and bow, 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 the, the shooting started. Now we're mobile. Then the gun stopped as the car was coming towards us. That was gone. Boshed out and up again. Then Mitchell's lying on the floor and he started groaning. So they've given him three round the heart. You can see his shirt jumping. And then there was bullets pinging, a couple of them must have missed because you could hear them off the side of the metal, you know. Smoke. How many times was he shot? Well, there was a revolver and an automatic. They did say the automatic had eight and the revolver had five. And apparently one got jammed in the silence and so I'd say there was 12 shots put in him. By now we've done the first right, we're coming up to the second. And he groaned again. I don't know if it was one of those where they, they sort of expel air or whatever. But uh, that's when Gerard said, I'm empty, give him another one. So Foreman put the gun under his ear and pop. That was the last shot. Who was Frank Mitchell's final executioner? I was. I had to, to finish it properly, but um, when it was done, uh, we we carried on, and, and uh, Albert jumped out of the car at the first bus stop, wanted to go. I had, when I got out, it was, it was a cold night. I had a big old crumbie coat on, I was waving it to get rid of the stench of this cold iron or powder, whatever they use. I had a good, I had about a 200 yard walk, which was okay. Stop my legs wobbling and... Yeah, nothing, nothing to fear. Uh, I don't know why I wanted to get out of the van so quick, because uh, he was in no danger himself. I was waiting for one myself, but... I was pleased to hear Gerard say, give him another one, Freddie, I'm empty because he's sitting next to me, so I've got half a chance, you know. I'm convinced that I've got to go, because I'm the middle man. But it didn't happen. Donahue returned to the flat to tell Lisa and the other minders to clean it thoroughly, so as to remove all trace of Frank Mitchell and themselves. He was greeted on the doorstep by a terrified Lisa. She had heard the shots and guessed that Mitchell had been murdered. Two days before the Christmas he had dreamed of. Donahue organised the clear-up. They burnt Mitchell's remaining clothes and wiped away his fingerprints. Donahue phoned Reggie Cray. Reggie wanted to see Lisa so that he could satisfy himself that she wouldn't talk. After it was all over, we were sitting in the car and I kept saying to you, if you're going to see Reggie, just don't mention the word bang. I said, don't mention bangs at all. And she said to me, when it's my turn, I want you to do it, because I think you'll do it quick. Nene. Pop her off, you know. She thought I would do it quick, whereas uh, the others might make it last or something shows you what state her head was in. Lisa was really speaking for her own life when she met Reggie. Yeah, that's what I kept drumming in. I don't mention bangs for Christ's sake. What would you have done if Reggie had decided that she couldn't be relied upon to keep quiet? I suppose I'd have gone along with it. Yeah. That would have meant that you'd have walked two people to their deaths in the space of 24 hours. Mm-hmm. 
pretty sure if he'd have said she's got to go, I might have argued about it, but in the end, she'd have probably gone. Lisa survived, but Frank Mitchell vanished. His father died hoping that one day his son's remains would lie beside him. The family has little now to remember him by, not even his last gift from prison. Like his life, it was corrupted by the craze and destroyed. Frankie sent the photo album home from Dartmoor, and on the front it, it was a thick padded one to Frank Mitchell from your friends in the East End. In the album, there was all photos of the Cray brothers, um, girls, boxers, and all them sort of people. When it was rumoured that Frankie had been murdered, my father ripped them all up and burnt them. He was devastated. We'd just sit and talk about him for hours on end, saying he should never have took him to the police station in the beginning. How would you like people to think of Frank, and how would you like... A kind and lovely man, which he was, and like, it'd be nice, even, I couldn't, no, I couldn't do it, but to cuddle him and squeeze him, and you just, just don't know how I feel, it's horrible, it's terrible. Frank is still missing, we don't know where he is. And there's still things unanswered? That's right. We've never been able to bury Frankie. On Wednesday, we go inside the Cray firm to reveal the secret criminal alliance that made the Crays seem untouchable, how corrupt police officers threatened the Cray investigation, what happened to Frank Mitchell's body, and how Mitchell had his ultimate revenge on the Cray firm. for watching. If you enjoyed the video please join our Facebook group. It's called Craze Crime Lords of London. We're a friendly moderated group with over 1,000 Cray and other celebrated gangster videos available for view. There's also thousands of images in the photos sections. The link for the group is in the YouTube description section. I hope we see you there soon.